Okay, the second presentation today, I would like to talk about managing feline panleukopenia in a shelter because it's a really big problem in the Midwest. Uh, we have done a study recently and I'm going to weave through the study information with the information about panleukopenia virus through my presentation. So I will give you some basic background information about the infection first, tell you about the Chicago study that the uh, Purdue Maddie Shelter Medicine Program performed over the last year at Poor Chicago, talk a little bit about quarantine and disinfection, vaccination, which is a crucial part of protecting cats against panleukopenia, and communication. So these are some headlines that I pulled from internet websites uh, just last week. Uh, it looks like panleukopenia is a very no newsworthy topic and it's killing a lot of cats out there. I think particularly in the Midwest and the Southwest, it seems to be a, an endemic problem in shelters and it's affecting large populations of cats. It seems to come in waves in outbreaks and uh, it's a real problem for uh, shelter cats. What do we know about the virus itself? Well, you know, you may say um, we don't really need to know about the virus because that's for somebody with white coats to take care of. Well, actually knowing a little bit about the virus can, can help you manage it because we know that it is highly, highly infectious. Uh, it's got no envelope. What's the practical significance of that? If a virus doesn't have an envelope, then there's a whole range of disinfectants like quaternary ammonium compounds that just won't get it. Those um, quaternary ammonium compounds, those disinfectants, the way they work is by breaking open that viral envelope and that's how they kill the virus. If you're working with a virus that has no envelope in the first place, then those disinfectants become useless. It's a DNA virus and it's one serotype. I always think um, about a photocopier when I'm thinking about this because that's what viruses do. They copy over and over and over again through generations. If they've got uh, DNA, um, if they're DNA viruses, they're pretty good quality photocopiers. They do a good, accurate job of reproducing themselves so that what happens is that you get a uniform set of clinical signs. So generation to generation, that virus doesn't change very much, so it produces pretty similar clinical signs. There's just one serotype with panleukopenia as well, so that also makes for pretty uniform clinical signs. The really bad thing that I think probably you all know about it is that it is very, very difficult to get rid of in the environment. We know that it can in remain infectious at room temperature for at least one year. So you need to do a really good cleanup because if you leave some fecal material, infected fecal material, for instance, in the shelter, even if you came back a year later and put a susceptible kitten in that environment, a year later it could be infected. So it's, it's really difficult to clean up, very hardy, and we need to know what we're doing as far as infection go, in, uh, disinfection goes. Mortality rate is uh, up to 50 to 90 percent. It's a severe, often fatal disease. A lot of you may have heard of uh, canine parvovirus 2C. I often think of it as C for cats because that's the one type of uh, canine parvovirus can, that can jump to cats. Uh, as far as we know, panleukopenia virus does not jump to dogs. So it's different from canine parvovirus 2C. It does, they all produce these fairly uniform clinical signs though of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. So what are the main methods of transmission? Direct contact is the most important method of transmission and environmental contamination. 
So this, the orofecal oro route, as you would expect with any disease that causes uh, diarrhea and vomiting. So we want to make sure that we clean up feces or vomitus from our environment. But sneezing can also spread the virus. A lot of the cats in the study that we did had URI at the same time as they had signs of panleukopenia. And these cats not only had vomiting and diarrhea, but they were sneezing. Their sneeze droplets contained infectious upper respiratory tract agents and also contained panleukopenia virus. So they can actually sneeze this virus into the environment as well. It's not just um, urine, feces and uh, vomitus. And it can have prenatal effects because panleukopenia crosses the placenta in pregnant queens. Uh, it can infect the fetus and it likes to, have, to um, infect rapidly dividing cells and just depending on the stage of pregnancy, it will go for a different anatomical area of the fetus. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but the main areas that are known to be infected earlier in pregnancy, it tends to be the retina. So you can have problems with um, these kittens not seeing well, although that tends to be a, uh, a not a, a common situation that occurs because if they're infected that early in pregnancy, often, um, often the, there will be abortions anyway. Uh, the other time that they can be infected, uh, the other place that they can be infected is in their cerebellum. That's part of their brain, uh, which is responsible for coordination of their movements. And if they get infected even after they've been born in the first few uh, weeks of life, their cerebellum can be affected so that they have what's called an intention tremor. Some people call them noddy kittens. So when they go to do something, they nod like that. The good news is that uh, once they develop those signs, then those signs aren't progressive throughout life. Okay, so that's as bad as they're going to be if they are still adoptable and can still have quality of life, then uh, those kittens can uh, be found uh, adoptive homes. A lot of the time they don't even really need special care. So as I said, panleukopenia virus likes rapidly dividing cells and so uh, it likes the intestine the bone marrow and the lymphoid tissue, which is why we see GI signs, diarrhea and also vomiting. And the bone marrow is infected, so panleukopenia, the bone marrow is no longer able to produce the normal uh, amount of white blood cells, so there's very few white blood cells in a blood smear. Uh, they, it affects the lymphoid tissue as well, so there's immunosuppression they're even more likely to get other common shelter-borne diseases such as upper respiratory infections. They often present with a fever and it tends to be a disease of kittens, so three to five months of age. And that is because this is the time when the antibodies that they have received from their mothers may be waning so that they, they perhaps were born with antibody, antibody protection from their mother. A lot of cats, cats are not born with any protection because their mother did not have any protection. A study by Dr. Levy from the uh, University of Florida, Maddie Shelter Medicine Program, on uh, community cats that were presented for spay and neuter found that about a quarter to a third of those cats did not have protective antibodies against panleukopenia virus. So if the adult cat doesn't have those antibodies, she can't give them to her kittens. So a lot of kittens are born with no protection. Some of them are born with protect uh, protective antibodies from their mothers and just enough protective antibodies to interfere with vaccination. So that's why we have to keep on vaccinating throughout kittenhood until 16 weeks of age because we're no, never quite sure how much they've got on board in the way of antibody protection. Is it enough to protect them? 
is it just enough to interfere with vaccination? So we want to vaccinate them from the age of four weeks every two weeks so that we're um, at, at least one of those vaccines will get them at a time when the vaccine can work and provide good protection. They do shed the virus after they are recovered for up to six weeks. Uh, usually it's just three weeks. So you might want to um, just bear this in mind with your quarantine uh, protocol. Uh, there, there is thought to be a carrier state, but this is unproven. Mostly they just shed for a few weeks after they've recovered, if they do recover from this disease. And a lot of them, as you know, don't recover. 